today is the second Sunday of Advent. I'm going to be back here again in Sparta, New Jersey. And the epistle for this second Sunday of Advent is taken from St. Paul's Letter to the Romans, chapter 15. Brethren, what things soever were written, were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. Now the God of patience and of comfort grant you to be of one mind, one toward another, according to Jesus Christ, that with one mind and with one mouth you may glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive one another, as Christ also hath received you, unto the honor of God. For I say that Christ Jesus was minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, but that the Gentiles are to glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, Therefore will I confess to thee, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and will sing to thy name. Again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and magnify him, all ye people. And again Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise up to rule the Gentiles, and him the Gentiles shall hope. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy, and peace in believing that you may abound in hope and in the power of the Holy Ghost and the gospel taking that according to St. Matthew chapter 11 at that time when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ sending two of his disciples he said to him art thou he that art to come or look we for another and Jesus making answer said to them Go and relate to John what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead rise again, the poor have the gospel preached unto them, and blessed is he that shall not be scandalized in me. And when they went their way, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What went you out into the desert to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft garments. Behold, they that are clothed in soft garments are in the houses of kings. But what went you out to see? A prophet? Yea, I tell you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my angel before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. Thus are the words of today's Holy Gospel. Um, In the second Sunday of the season of Advent, Advent meaning the season of the coming, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are preparing for the coming of our Lord. And it's interesting how a thousand years ago, the saints, the fathers, the doctors, the priests, all spoke about the second coming. That the Advent was the time of the preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ. When he shall come in power and majesty to judge the living and the dead. That's Advent. We also prepare in a secondary way as a reminder of that first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when he came on December the 25th at Christmas. Now we are near the second coming. A thousand years ago during Advent they considered the coming of Christ in judgment. Now that we're near the end of times we consider the memory of the Christ child and think nothing about his coming. Adventus means he's coming, not he has already come. He has already come 2,000 years ago when he was born in the, 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 as a child in Bethlehem. He came 6,000 years ago when his mouth spoke and said, let there be light. When God's divinity and God's magnificence and God's wonder entered into light. And it entered into the sun. And it entered into the earth. And it entered into all things. He came. He came when he said, upon nothing, let there be light. He came again when he became man. 2,000 years ago. But this is the season of Advent. The season of preparing for his coming. He is coming yet again. 
And this coming was spoken of by our Lord Jesus Christ on Good Friday in his last few hours on this earth. He uses this word Advent and speaks of his coming. He says, Behold, Caiaphas, thou shalt see the Son of Man adventing. Thou shalt see the Son of Man coming. He is coming. You think you are sending me away to be crucified? I am going to be crucified of my own free will. You are doing no sending. You are doing no commanding. You have no authority or power over me any more than does this ant or the devil or any rock or anything. You are saying words that have no power. I go to death because I choose to go to death. I spoke and the world came into being. I decided to become man and I became man at the precise moment, at the precise place, in the precise manner that I wanted. I even arranged which rocks would be in that cave, which sheep would see me as a little baby and the other sheep just missed out. I chose how much hair would be on the dogs and how much hair would be on the sheep and on the goats. And some that were shorn, the wolves did not see my coming. I chose everything. And I choose the coming of the sun every morning. And I choose the coming of the stars every year. And I choose the coming and goings of all the animals and all living and non-living things. I am not interested in your foolish teaching and your commands. They have no power. But I men and men I say unto you, you, Caiaphas, though you are dead and have no eyes, though you are decayed for 2,000 years in the earth, I will put your eyes back into your head. I will reunite your body to your soul that you might see my coming. And I will come in great power and majesty. And you, Caiaphas, shall see it. He said these words not only to Caiaphas, but to all men. And therefore the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ know that he's coming. And on the first Sunday of Advent, there was a hymn written a thousand years ago. Dies ire, dies ila, solvet seclum in vavila, teste David cum sabila. That hymn was written for the first Sunday of Advent. O day of wrath and day of ire, when the world shall melt in fire. And the whole world shall melt in fire. It was told by David and Sybil's lyre. Not only did David the Jew sing of it, but even the pagan Sybil sang of it. Not only are the Jews preparing for his coming, but the Gentiles are also preparing for his coming. Not only will those that are followers of Jesus Christ await his coming, but those that are his enemies await his coming. Some await in hope and expectation, others await in fear. But all await his coming. This is the season of Advent. Christ is coming. Now when we look at the gospel today, we can see how Jesus Christ prepared his own coming. And we also know that, that the devil is the ape of Christ. He mocks Christ. He imitates Christ. He can't do anything on his own. We were speaking briefly to the seminarians earlier this week. St. Thomas Aquinas about the exemplar cause. We can't build anything of our own. We can't do anything of our own. We imitate what we've seen. So if I want to build a house, I don't just build a house. I build one like the one that I was raised in. I build one like the one I saw in my town. I build one like the ones that I've seen. And if I'm going to invent some new thing, like these modern magicians and these modern idiots, when they invent monsters, what do they do? They take the head of a dog and put it on top of a giraffe. <laughs> they take the things they see and they mix them together, but they cannot invent any new thing. They're always following an example. So is Satan. Satan cannot invent a new way. Satan can only imitate and mock the way of God. And so we can read a little bit how Satan shall prepare his coming by knowing John the Baptist. Because our Lord Jesus Christ sent St. John the Baptist as the final preparation before his coming. And what does he say in the gospel today? 
What were you out in the desert to see? Our Lord was happy they went out to the desert. And yet in the gospel of St. Matthew chapter 24, he will say, At the end of the world, they will say, He is in the desert, go ye not out. So here Christ says, I'm glad you went to the desert. But at the end of the world, they will say, Go to the desert, go ye not out. The devil is the ape of Christ. Just like St. John the Baptist went into the desert, and they went to see him, this strange man, who eats locusts, dressed in rags of the sheep, and washes people with a baptism that they have never seen before at the waters of the river Jordan. Speaks of penance. Well, our Lord intimates the kind of prophets that will come at the end of times. What would you out in the desert to see? A reed shaken by the wind? A reed shaken by the wind? St. Jerome says, what is a reed shaken by the wind? He is the heart and bones of modern man. He is like a reed. A carnal man. He says, the man that is ruled by the flesh, he is like a reed. He's lost his skeletal bones. He's lost his strength. A man that follows the flesh, he is like unto a reed, and he blows with every wind. And what is the wind? We also know in sacred scripture, what is the wind? St. Augustine tells us, one day St. Peter got out of a boat. When there was a great storm in the Sea of Galilee. And he walked across the sea in the storm. Why? Because he saw Jesus Christ. And that's what you're supposed to do in a storm. If you're in a storm and you're inside of a boat. And you see Christ is not in that boat. Get out. <laughs> if he's not in the boat. It ain't the place to be. <laughs> if he's in the boat. If he's sleeping. That's fine. So long as he's in the boat. But if he is not in the boat, get out. Peter was wise. The other 11 apostles were not so wise. He got out of the boat. And he started walking across the sea. And what does the scripture tell us? He took an account of the winds and the waves. And he began to sink. He took an accounting of the wind. What is this wind, says St. Augustine? It's a false doctrine of the world. It's what the world teaches you know, the world has many, many teachings, many, many lies, but they all have one thing in common. They're not like Christ. And they're not like His words. As it says in the sacred scripture, the number of the sorrows of the just is many, but the sorrows of the fool are infinite. And the number of the fools, they are also infinite. There's always an infinite number of fools. An infinite number of foolish ways. An infinite number of foolish lies. People go out in the desert today. That's why you move. That's why you move. My home is where my family lives. But they're all rotten. They don't love me. The ones that didn't get aborted. The ones that barely made it to this world. And so I'm going to move. I'm going to another place. So when you leave your home, you go out to the desert. What do you go out in the desert to see? A reed shaken by the wind. That's the difference. When our Lord Jesus Christ was happy, they went out in the desert. What did they go out in the desert to see? A rock. The truth. Sacred scripture tells us that by the symbolism of scripture, St. Augustine tells us, St. Jerome tells us, the wind is false doctrine. Even St. Paul says, they followed every wind of doctrine. The wind, can you see it? No. Where does it come from? I don't know. But it blows things all over the place. And one day the wind blows things to the north. Another day it changes its mind and it goes to the south. Some days it really can't make up its mind and we have a tornado. And it blows it east, west, north, south. Every single millisecond it changes direction. The wind is invisible. We don't know from whence it comes. Where does it come from? The father of lies. That's where it comes from. And when the wind leaves, where does it go? When the wind passes by, where does it go? It goes away. As all the lies from Satan go away. 
They make noise. They cause damage. They tear down buildings. They rip up all civilizations. And then when they're finished, the wind is gone. Such are the lies of the devil. And they are legion. They are legion. What were you out in the desert to see? A reed shaken by the wind. That's what's going to happen at the end of times. Remember, the opposite of what happens to St. John is what will happen at the end of times. We are in the end of times now. So when is the desert time? In the daytime. Well, it's at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning. That's when you turn on your TV and you watch those little commercials. The secrets of success. When you follow my little manual for only $19.99, which is always the cost, except in the old days it was $9.99, but due to inflation, it's increased. But what happens in this desert at 2 o'clock in the morning? You learn a new secret, fast way to success, and you don't have to work. You just sit back and let the money roll in. What do people go out into the desert to see today? They won't go out to see an end to suffering. They go out to see an end of poverty. They go out to see the quick way to receive money. They go out to see the easy way to get girls. The easy way to get pleasure. The easy way to get money. The easy way to get popularity. The magic pill to make me lose my 400 pounds. The easy way to weight loss. The easy way to brain loss. Just turn your TV on and you have brain loss. All the easy ways. Modern man is willing to work so hard. Suffer so much. Undergo all manner of hardship. In order to make things easier. Remember one time when I was a kid. My brother was dedicated to laziness. <coughs> There was no electricity, the water wasn't working. I said, get over there, get up there, take the little glass bottle of gallon jug, go up to the top of the hill, take the hand pump of water, fill it up, and walk down. It was a terrible distance. It was about 70 feet. <laughs> so he went and got the tractor. The tractor was hooked up to a plow. He unhooked the plow. Because bolts were stuck, took a while. He hooked up the tractor to the carry-all, which was loaded up with junk. So he unloaded the junk off the carry-all. He put the carry-all in the back of the tractor. He drove over and took the empty one-gallon bug, a bottle of, of uh, and drove it up to the top of the hill, filled it with water, drove it down, and when he stopped, it fell over and it broke. Now he got mom, mad mommy syndrome. Now he's got to take a second bottle and walk up the hill, clean, fill it up, He's got to come down, pick up all the glass. He's got to park the tractor. He's got to put the junk back on the carry-all. He's got to hook up the plow. And why did he devote two hours to that job? Because he didn't want to work. That's modern man. We will fast and abstain. We will go into the desert. We will suffer great things if it's going to make everything easier. How much easier things are going to be when I find a magic pill that will take away my depression. When I find the right doctor, we're willing to go into the desert. And these are the modern Christs. The modern Christs are going to take away your suffering. The modern Christs are going to justify you in your sin. And the modern Christs change their teaching every day. And they change their teaching based on whom they receive. Whatever you want to hear, that's what they're going to teach you. Whatever is going to help them make a few more rupees, that's what they're going to teach you. What do you go out in the desert to see? When Christ spoke 2,000 years ago, they were men. They went out in the desert to see, not a reed shaken by the wind. They went out in the desert to see a man of God. And then our Lord says, where are the soft garments? They are found in the houses of kings. And we forgot to mention this in the first sermon earlier today. But what is the last part of the, just before that, our Lord says, 
The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. The poor have the gospel preached unto them. At the end of times, man will not want to hear the gospel anymore. These are our times. At the end of times, St. Paul says to Timothy, they will have itching ears and they will heap unto themselves liars. We pay, they're called psychiatrists. They're called modern scientists. They're called Stephen Hawking's. And then moron Dawkins. <laughs> and all the other imbeciles that the modern world puts before you to tell you that there is no God. They tell you you came from an ape. Which means you're a God. Because your brain doesn't go above that of an ape anyway. So if you're going to be a God, you're going to have to start saying that you're at least better than the average ape. <laughs> Only problem is you're not. You're more stupid than an ape. St. Anthony pointed that out 800 years ago. Of the animals who have no brains have more brains than men. Because they know their God. But man does not. What do we go out in the desert to see? Reeds shaken by the wind. A new special shop that sells soft garments only available on the internet. Not sold in stores. Only available now while they're cold. By now all supplies last. <coughs> What are all these things appealing to? Telling 7 billion people that you're the last one to get all this stuff. Did somebody ever wake up and say, how come I, if every unique person has holy genes, why does every unique person ever know we're the same kind of holy genes? <laughs> why is it that I'm the only person in the world that thinks the same thing that every other person in the world also thinks? Maybe I'm not the only person in the world thinking these stupid lies. No one figures that out. But they all believe the lies. Everyone wants to go on the desert. Everyone wants to go on the road that's less traveled by. So long as there's a Starbucks on the side. So long as there's a mall somewhere along the way. So long as there's a lot of comfort. And they've done a good job with the road construction. And there's a lot of other people there because I don't want to be alone when I'm traveling alone. We are in an age of modern fools. But it is the age of the opposite of what is recorded in the Gospel of St. Matthew concerning the time of St. John the Baptist, which means we are in the age of the Antichrist. We cannot know the day of his coming. And our Lord said we cannot know the day or the hour, but we can know the circumstances. We can know the situation, and we are in it now. We are in it now. The poor have the gospel preached to them. What does that indicate? If you're rich, it's hard to believe the gospel. If you're rich, somehow there's a wall between you and the gospel. And so what does Satan do in the last 150 years? The last 200 years? He makes all men believe that they're rich. All men have money now. All men have possessions now. You know that beggars now eat better than kings used to. A king couldn't have an apple any day he wanted. He had to wait till the right season and hope some farmer brought him an apple. Now you can have an apple any time, any day, anywhere in the world. Kings could not do that a hundred years ago. And so the poor eat better than kings in our times. And everyone is told about money. By the little devil box called the TV. Now the internet is just a deeper version of the same devil box. Now remember the lies that are found in these things are only part of the problem. The impurity that's found in these things are only a part of the problem. If there was only doctrinal lies and impurity on the internet and the TV, it would not cause such great harm. The greater harm caused by these devices is how it changes our whole spirit. How it changes our whole essence of being. It changes our whole nature so that boys all become effeminate. And girls become macho. And they lose their motherhood. And they lose their femininity. And they lose their manhood. And they lose their boyhood. And they lose their understanding of the God of nature and the God of all things. They lose it all. And they learn to live in life without even the slightest thought of God. Notice all the movies. 
Notice how many die. You see death every day in the movies. This is to train you how to die. Hmm. And when they die in the movies, they never say, Lord, forgive me. They never say, confess me. They never say that they are sinners. They never speak of God. They die without the thought of God. They speak of money. They speak of pleasure. They speak of the old times. That's what they do. And therefore we're being trained. Softness is being trained inside of our bloods. The poor of the gospel preach to them. But no man is poor anymore. And even those that are physically poor. Their thought is only on success. Their thought is only on money. And therefore they might physically have nothing. But their hearts are just as wicked as the rich man. And they are filled with riches in their eyes. Filled with riches in their hearts. Filled with riches in all their desires. And that's why they take TV and put them in the villages. I see them in Arun Kandi. Hey, my beloved village in India where you used to say the mass. What do they do? They bring electricity to the village. Why do they bring electricity to the village? Not so they can have water. Not so they can have it lights. So they can have a TV. And the government gives a free TV to every single village in India. That they might see materialism. And that they might see them to change their desires. They were so happy with their life in the village for a thousand years. But their life was too simple in the village. Their life was too peaceful in the village. Too many souls went to heaven in the village. And so therefore they bring in the TV that they might desire riches and that none of them will be poor anymore. And therefore they are immune to the gospel. Come and preach them the gospel. The more TV, the more immunity to the gospel. The poor have the gospel preached to them. And therefore Satan wants to have a world in which there is no poverty. And what does he say? He creates satanic priests. The good satanic priests are the honest ones that at least do human sacrifices, cut out hearts, and eat babies. Those are the good ones. But then there's the wimpy satanic priests who are working for Satan in a much more effective and powerful way. And these are the ones that are called priests of the church. And who tell people Christ came to end poverty. When Jesus Christ said, the poor you will always have with you. And when I come to the poor, I come to preach them the gospel. He made it abundantly clear that he's not here to end poverty. But Satan speaks about the ending of poverty. Satan talks about creating heaven on earth, which cannot be done. Satan speaks about these things. It is Satan who is inside of these modern priests who want to end poverty. It is Satan inside of all these modern evangelical ministers who talk about the love of Jesus is related to making a lot of money. Before I believed in the Lord, I didn't have much, but I believed in the Lord. He blessed me. He blessed me with a brand new Mercedes. <laughs> he blessed me with a big house. <laughs> the Lord blessed me. I don't love these things, but I love the Lord. Lord, I can use a pay raise. <laughs> they love the Lord. It's called the prosperity gospel. And they'll go out in the desert to preach the prosperity gospel. And those men that are carnal, says St. Augustine, they will go out in the God, they will go out in the desert because they think there's more pleasure there. They'll go out in the desert because there's quick wealth there. That's why they went west in the history of our beloved country. There's gold in them thar hills. And they went west. Did they go west to rough it? Did they go west to suffer? No. They went west for money. They went west for quick wealth. So California became populated. Hasn't changed much. And so man wants money. He doesn't want the gospel. And he becomes immune to the gospel. The poor of the gospel preach to them. Now everyone's rich. They don't need the gospel. And we are reed shaken by the wind. How is it that we're reed shaken by the wind? There are many preparations of Satan for his coming. One is doctrine. 
The wind of false doctrine. What is it the opposite of? Christ. Christ said, I am the truth. St. Paul finished it by saying, Et Petros era Christus. And they all drank of the same spiritual drink from the rock. The, the rock that was in the desert that Moses had them drink from. And the rock was Christ. The truth, the rock, Christ. And then what did he say to the principal priest? What is a priest of the New Testament? We priests of the New Testament are called Alter Christus. We are called another Christ. What is the principal priest of the New Testament called? He is called Petrus. He is called Petrus, which means the rock. He is called Peter, the rock. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Thou art the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. It is the rock of true doctrine. It doesn't sink in the waves. What does the devil want to produce? He wants to produce, as we mentioned in the first sermon, soft sponges. Soft, spineless sponges. That's modern man. He's soft, he's spineless, he's a sponge. Our Lord Jesus Christ is hard, filled with bones, a spine that doesn't bend. He's a rock. Pour water on a rock. What happens? It doesn't get wet. It doesn't get wet. But pour a drop of water on a sponge, and the water expands in the sponge. <laughs> Sponges have nothing in them to hold themselves. The devil wants to create soft, spineless sponges that they might be ready for Satan. Christ needs rocks. Satan needs sponges. Christ needs truth. Satan needs lies. Christ sent St. John the Baptist out in the desert that those who want to find some, some truth in God will go out there to see a rock. To go out there to see a man of penance. To see a man of truth. But at the end of times, they will pay lots of money. And they will make great sacrifices to go out into the desert to see something soft. To see some fake wonder. To see some way in order to make life easier. Now how do you prepare souls for Satan? One of the best ways which we have nowadays, and we're in the final times, TV, internet, iPad, cell phone, and children. When the child is looking at that cell phone, what is he learning? He's being taught doctrine. What is a doctrine? The doctrine is quite simple. You, my son, you, my little daughter, you are a god and a goddess. You are God. Now what is God? God is the center of all things. God is the reason for all things. Speaking to an advertiser, one of my parishioners, within about 15 years ago, he says, you know, in the old days, whenever, the, the advert whenever companies wanted to sell for children, the advertising was appealing to the mother and the father. You must buy these kind of cornflakes because they're very healthy for your children. And you must do this and do that because we had to convince the parents that something was good for their children. But this has changed. Now we know that parents do not control their children. And parents do not decide what is best for their children. Except maybe the best part of aborting them or abandoning them. Either completely by divorce or at least part time by daycare. Therefore the child becomes God. And hence advertising has changed. We now advertise to the child. And the child tells mommy what he wants. And the child tells daddy what he demands. And the daddy and the mother, they are slaves of the children. Therefore the child is God. We used to obey something called the commandments. If you remember, if you look in a book when you were a child, you will have heard there might have been ten of them. And commandments. You're even supposed to obey them. Because they're the law of God. But now there is a new God. Which is the desire of the child. 
The child is God. And the child must be adored. And the child must be pleased. The child is the center of the universe. That's one reason why it's so important to have only one or two children. Because if you have too many children, the child might think he's just one of a bunch of kids. Can't have that. He must be the center of the universe. He must believe he's a god. And so you have one child, and he's got two sets of grandparents. Not anymore. That's in the old days. That's 20 years ago. Now when I meet children and ask them how many fathers you got. One I met last week, he's got, or two weeks ago, he's got three fathers and four mothers. Because <laughs> you know all the divorces and remarriages and everything, and all the living together and everything else. So, he, so he's got the three, and he's got four fathers and three mothers, or I forget which. Uh, six is a common number. Some are limited and only have four. <laughs> Occasionally you run across a child that has only a mother and a father, but that's weird. <laughs> and so the fact is that the child, the child has many mothers and many fathers, and they're all centered on him. He's the center of the universe. And then we're hearing a report on NPR within the last few years, within the last ten years, that Christmas has become a terrifying time for parents. Because they're afraid of buying the wrong thing for their kids. Because when December 25th comes and they open the parent, because they're going to say, this is the wrong color uh, toy, this is the wrong kind of fire truck, this is the wrong this and the wrong that, and you know I don't like this kind of clothing, and what are you doing buying this? And they will be yelled at at Christmas. On December 26th, the stores are filled with all the returns because of children who did not get what they want. What does this mean? The child is God. You see, Cain once brought a sacrifice to God, but God wasn't happy. He told him to take it back. Now, since the child is God, he can do the same thing. The child decides. Why is he trained this way? This is a part of communism. Why do communists do this? In Laos and Cambodia, not only in our modern century, but it happened in ancient times as well. The communists told the soldiers, 25-year-old, 30-year-old soldier, you see that 13-year-old boy? He's your boss. And they would take a 13-year-old boy and he would travel with a soldier to the prison camp in Cambodia. And the boy would say, shoot him. And if the boy said shoot, he must shoot him. He's the boss. And the boy would make the soldiers, make the, make the men in the camp beg for their lives. And sometimes he would save their lives, sometimes he would kill them. But the soldier decided, and did not decide anything, it was the child that decided. And they were told, you will obey that boy. He's the one that decides. Now why do they do that? Because when that boy grows up, he will be a great servant of Satan. Why is that? Because the God of the boy is pleasure. Now once that becomes his God, all you have to do is let him grow up and have millions of those gods. Now seven billion of them. And then take away their pleasure. Just take it away. Do you want your pleasure back? I want my pleasure back. Okay. You have to do a few things. <laughs> See that priest over there? Kill him. <laughs> oh, by the way, and your mother, kill her too while you're on the way over there. <laughs> they will do it without a thought. They don't have to tell you to kill your mother today. They don't have to tell you to kill the priest today. Not necessary. They'll only tell you that at the last moment. All they need to do is make you believe that you are God. Driving from New Hampshire last night, seeing the signs. Love the way you live. <laughs> By the way, I'm sick of seeing this. I've seen this in Catholic houses now. Live, laugh, love. If that's in your house, burn it. <laughs> Live, laugh, love. Live well. Laugh often. Love, everybody. What does that mean? It means that you care only about yourself. It means you live only for pleasure. If someone can make you laugh, you be with them. But if they don't make you laugh anymore, well, eliminate them from your life. Mm. And love just means pleasure. 
These are the false gods. Burn them. A child does not get food whenever he decides he feels like he wants food. You don't adapt to the child. The child must adapt to the world around him. You eat at breakfast, you eat at lunch, you eat at dinner. You don't eat all the time. Remove those cell phones. Remove those iPads from the child. Look at them. They are centered in the little universe. And if you interrupt them, you will have hell to pay. We see God is the one who sends people to hell. Since the child is God, he will make your life hell when you no longer are pleasing to him. He's a tyrant when he's young. But when he grows older, he will be a perfect slave. Because when he goes out into the world, he will still want that pleasure at all times. He will still want those good old days. The devil will come and say, all right, you want the good old days? All right, here's a few requirements for you. You're going to have to give up all your freedoms. You're going to have to give up what little religion you think you have. And this is our world. It is the world in which the John the Baptists of our times are everywhere. They're not really in the desert, because remember the devil is the father of lies. He's in your living room. You don't have to go to the desert. Mm -hmm. The desert is called the internet. The desert is called the TV channel. Creating a world in which everyone is a reed shaken by the wind. And everyone wants soft garments. And everyone believes they're rich or their only purpose of life is to attain wealth. If you ask a child 150 years ago, what do you want to be when you grow up? Would they say a millionaire? No. Ask any child today, what do you want to be? I want to be a millionaire. That's what I want to be. Because when you're a millionaire, you have everything. People love you and respect you. And if they don't, you can always pay someone to remove them from this life. Mm. And so when you're a millionaire, you can fall, you can solve every problem, and you can have extreme happiness. The Lord is coming. The advent of Christ is near. Only His coming is a judge. And He will come to judge the living and the dead. And St. Paul tells us in the epistle... That the hope of the Gentiles is Christ. And what is a great trouble today? Gentiles are putting their hope in psychiatrists. They're putting their hope in modern science. They're putting their hope in modern economics. You know, it is a blasphemy against God. The amount of time that Catholics spend in front of Fox News talking about the economy. It's the economy, stupid. It's how much money you need. We're worried about the taxes. We're going to vote for the government that's going to make us keep our jobs. We're going to vote for the government that's going to keep our money. We're going to, we want money, 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 money. That money is our God. And it is a form of idolatry against Jesus Christ. And do you think he doesn't notice? How many traditional Catholics firmly believe in the truth of the economics of Fox News? Mm. How many traditional Catholics think about the money and spend their whole life thinking about the money so that the gospel has no effect upon them? Zilch. And they are reeds shaken by the wind. They adjust every minute to whatever gives them pleasure. Whatever gives them pleasure. We must be rocks of the faith. We must stand firm in that holy faith. And our Lord says this to us. Prepare for the coming of the Lord. He's coming soon. He's going to come in his chastisement. And by the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary. There shall rise a root of Jesse. The root of Jesse says. uh, St. Jerome in his sermon today. The root of Jesse is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And from this blessed Virgin Mary, from the root of Jesse, shall rise the hope of the Gentiles. Who is the hope of the Gentiles? Our Holy Mother. And we must not follow the dress of the modern world. 
We must not follow the TV and the, and the, and the, the, the distractions of the modern world. Pulling us apart away from God. We are being trained to be spineless sponges. That will very quickly turn into the most wicked and cruel. You will not be told that you have to deny Christ until the appropriate moment. It would make you feel bad if you were told that today. So they'll wait, knowing full well that you will quickly deny Him. The only way in which we can persevere through this great crisis is that if we have a great love of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a great confidence in our holy faith, and we stand firmly upon the rock, the rock of absolute certitude of our faith, that the earth truly is in the center of the universe, that the sun is really going about the earth. That the world was created 6,000 years ago in 6 days. And these simple truths modern fools do not know. And that Jesus Christ is only God. Oh true God and true man. And there is no other God. And there is no other religion. And their only way to be saved is to be pleasing to Him. Following His word. The Verbum Christi, like it said last week. The Verbum Christi, the word of Christ. One word of Christ. One word that never changes. We don't need to find a new desert. We don't need to find a new Christ. We don't need to find a new way. We must follow the way given to us by Christ. And beware of the false prophets of the modern world. Who are in the desert. Teaching softness. In the desert, teaching how you don't need to suffer in the prosperity gospel, charismatic movement, and so on. Deny all these things. Stay firmly with Christ, and He will prepare us for the kingdom of heaven. And stay faithful to His Holy Mother. Live inside of her arms and inside of her womb, and all will be well. Blessing God bless you all. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.